Okay. So our next speaker is, is uh, Leon Zinski, and he'll uh, be telling us about a long title. Passive aggressive sequence <laughs> labeling with really processing for recognizing person entities and tweets. So, take a look. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I think we have maybe the the second longest title of all of the uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So the general problem is uh, uh, finding names of people uh, um, in tweets, and, and Twitter is pretty uh, diverse genre uh, with many many applications uh, that, that can be drawn over it. But, but one, one thing we kind of need to do is a fairly basic step is to find where people are. Uh, so, so maybe we can use this later on to, to see who's participating in, a, in an event or who, who a claim relates to. Uh, or many other things. Why Twitter? Well, there are many social media platforms available, but it's been proposed, and I think it's a fairly solid proposal, that we treat Twitter perhaps as the model organism of all the social media we have. So Twitter is our, Twitter is our fruit plate. In essence, so we've carried on with this with this platform, and just just to get a brief idea of the genre, uh, we've mostly started off, and a lot of NLP research over the past twenty years has focused or been based on uh, findings of the newswire text and certain some of our largest and best annotated corporate company in this genre. Uh, but as Jacob Eisenstein, I think, pointed out last year uh, at NACL, um, this, this, the, 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 where there's a, a really very, very strong bias in these corpora. Uh, they're, they're, they're written uh, and edited predominantly by working age uh, middle class white men who are journalists as well. And so this, this this is a really narrow segment of society. And when we look over at Twitter, you have a much broader range of authors. So you have many, many, many different styles. Uh, and it really, really puts, it really exposes some of the deficiencies of building resources just based on um, this, this, this very narrow set. And the kinds of things you find in Twitter will range from the very formal, so, which is uh, maybe news headlines, which you also see in Newswire, going through to conversations or uh, um, lexicalized uh, colloquial phrases with sort of a, a, an orthography that matches, matches the speech, and, and then even tweets that are just noise, essentially, with uh, things we don't find in our conventional gazetteers, hashtags, URLs, and so on. Why should we look at person entities? Well, there are many different entities. Types and there's the entity classification schemes tend to be fairly arbitrary as well. Uh, but in all our existing resources and also in the, 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 the small resources we have that do contain Twitter annotations, everybody includes a person. So we can stick with this one. Uh, and it should help us with our, with our event extraction as well. 
they do seem to have a very, very long tail where the, the, the person phrase, uh, the, the types of person phrase you see don't, don't have a, a, a big, big, very common uh, part of the, the, that gives you a sort of power law curve. It's, it's really, really very long. And there's a lot of variety in diversity there. And this makes it hard to crack using just the plain gazetteer approach. But they are required to mine conversations, which isn't always important. But when you have messages that are so short, it's, uh, you don't have the context. And a lot of NLP methods rely on having context. So once we can extract conversations, we can get a larger amount of text, and we have better context, and our other tools can do better. Uh, unfortunately, extracting persons from tweets is, uh, is, is, is difficult, so uh, taking the same, using the same model trained on uh, a good NER data set, um, the kernel gives us maybe a 7%-ish error rate, uh, but the error rate is four times higher uh, on, on tweets. So we took a machine learning approach to doing NER in tweets. Uh, we thought we need to add some features that are going to compensate for the different orthography uh, and a lot of the and various uh, well, and variations. Uh, so we included some, some uh, character engrams and maybe some, some lemma features uh, and also things representing word shape to capture capitalization, for example. Uh, and structural patterns that come from uh, capitalization. Conventional approaches to, to name entity recognition tend to be uh, um, tend to be sequence labeling, especially CRF is is, uh, is fairly popular. But Twitter exhibits a lot of disfluency. Uh, and a lot of fragments, which makes it quite different from news wire. And the long structures you might see in news text may not really be present uh, as complete sequences in tweets. So how about what, how, how do we do on tweets if we throw out, out this idea that we should label the entire reference as a, as a sequence and only use features? Which is representing immediate, very lo local context. Uh, so, adding these extra features that should handle some of the noise gives us a, a, a nice performance increase with the standard NER. But then, if we just apply using exactly the same feature sets, uh, SVN or maximum entropy, we get Better if one measure straight away, ignoring any of the sequence features. However, not all is lost. Uh, when we take in CRF, then we get an even better score. So the, the, the difference, so sequence labeling is useful, but the difference that it makes is a bit smaller in this genre. And of course, this, this kind of an F measure of 70 something is still fairly weak, and it's not going to help us really mine accurate conversations and build a context in a, um, in a consistent and reliable way. So we, we investigated some uh, adaptation 
patience to do the algorithms we could use. We looked at um, SVM with uneven margins, which relies on the intuition that maybe you have a very, very skewed data set. And uh, so, so maybe it makes sense to move the high plane a little bit closer to the minority class. So when you're looking at unclassified instances, uh, the distribution might be a bit closer to that of uh, what you see in the labels. And SVN can be quite good at tolerating noise as well. We also looked at CRF uh, using passive aggressive updates, which instead of uh, updating the uh, the weights based on every single training instance you see behaves in one of two ways. It's either passive, uh, so when an example's hinge loss is zero to incorporate into the model, then we skip updates. But if the hinge loss is greater than zero, there's some weight in scaling applied. And this Gives a little bit of tolerance to noise, seeing as it's based on the hinge loss function and adapting to how the example looks compared to uh, our existing data. So, using just these, just a simple classifier and the features we spoke about, uh, we applied it to our corpus, which we took from just just Twitter data using the person entity that was, was agreed upon uh, uh, for 86,000 tokens and uh, just uh, coming up to 2,000 entities. Precision wise, Stanford and NEA are still doing very, very well, uh, uh, but measure wise, not so well. The Ritter system, which is designed to do uh, Twitter any other uh, has very very high recall. Uh, well, the high, highest recall. I wouldn't say very, very high, maybe. Uh, and the CRF with passive aggressive updates does best overall. So this seems to be leading. And we found interesting that the best precision actually came from. Uh, system ignoring the sequences and just using immediate context, uh, which got even better position, precision than the Sanford system. A risk to have a little bit of an advantage here. I mean, CRF and PA, this, this recall isn't good, good enough uh, uh, to, to apply. Um, so, uh, but the Ritter system is also using, in addition to the training data and labeling, huge amounts of bootstrap data, uh, which lexicons can be extracted from. And it's not always it's not always easy to reproduce this from other languages and adapt it to new languages, or even to new data to combat entity drift. So how, how can we improve recall without this work? We look to the problems we had in recall. Uh, typical missed entities look like, like this. Uh, and in, I think in each case it's kind of a, a name that you might be able to find in a gazetteer. It's easy to, to imagine that the gazetteer would contain these things. How can we include these without reducing our precision, which is always a risk when we have a large gazetteer? Well, we know that post editing can be pretty effective in fixing up output from automatically generated machine translation. So maybe we can build a post editor. And we formulate this 
this as a as a binary problem. Looking at cases in the text, um, so uh, the, the are not entities. And we want to know is it a given uh, a bit of non-entity text actually a person? But of course, this is also the the, uh, the, the general problem that we start, started with. So, so we need to, to reduce our search space pretty drastically. Uh, uh, and so, so maybe we can say, well, if we if we have a list of known persons and names, does a token in a in an out of entity sequence begin with a known person name? If it does, then we'll try and label it. Maybe we can train something that can solve this problem. So when we get some trigger that something's an entity, we can have a look at it. And we can find this window just to two tokens, because we found the person names and tweets um, predominantly have just two tokens, uh, which are I think makes up 96, 97% of all of the first-person mentions, uh, which is considerably higher than our F measure um, beforehand. So given these triggers, uh, we, we try and look, look at these uh, two token window. And you can see some example here, here of what a two token window might look like given the trigger. So how well does it do? Well, we looked at some baselines where we firstly just, uh, without the step where we started, with an F of 80, 80 and a bit. Um, maybe we can approximate the Gazetteer approach on top of this, which is a little bit helpful. But we get really low F1 on, on, on this. Entities, uh, and this is this is due to very very, very low precision. It's tackling a lot of things that aren't entities. So if we train a cost-sensitive SVM, which gives us the ability to ask for X, better to recall, then we get uh, really, really nice results. Um, if we train and even for precision, we get a nice improvement. And overall, we get a three and a half percent absolute performance increase, uh, which brings us quite, quite far over the, the baseline of the system. The kinds of errors that we have uh, in terms of false positives, these are the difficult things. Things we're left with. Uh, finding things of the wrong class. Uh, maybe there's a descriptive title that's capitalized and looks a bit like a person's name. Uh, a name in a non name sense. So Mary Claire is, in this sense, was used as a magazine. Uh, and polysemous names. Well, there's Mark, but Mark could also be a verb. Or an account. The false negatives we get uh, are due to capitalization quite often. Uh, very, very small, small spelling errors that the that, that, uh, user might make uh, that don't occur in the gazetteer and then are missed. Common nouns that occur as person names. Straw could be a common noun. But in this case, is a, uh, a proper noun. And un uncommon names, uh, spicy pickle junior, wasn't really hit in our tra training data or our lexicon. So, to, to, to sum up very briefly, um, the passive aggressive adaptation of CRF helps name identity recognition. Recognition here, and an automatic post editing is feasible and does help 
called recall, which is really what we need. And SVM doing this post editing is much better than a gas tip. And the only external resource we need is a name list. So it's quite easy to adapt. Well, it's relatively easy to adapt to other languages. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, any questions?